Thank you for joining us today for an important discussion about fair representation in the media, specifically in the editorial and opinion sections where important policy discussions take place. My name is Brenda Victoria Castillo, President and CEO of the National Hispanic Media Coalition, a civil and human rights organization that was founded to eliminate hate, discrimination and racism towards Latino community. We educate to increase visibility of Latinx from our policy work in Washington, DC to our media advocacy work in Hollywood. NHMC is proud to co-host with UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Initiative, this community forum unseen and unheard, the underrepresentation of Latino voices and stories in the Los Angeles Times. Today, UCLA released a report that looks at the inclusion of Latino voices at the Los Angeles Times, a newspaper that covers a region that is almost 50% Latino. While we'll discuss our findings in greater length shortly, I will foreshadow that during this time frame of the poll of the study that included a presidential election where the Latino vote was critical. Amid a pandemic that devastated our community, we find that only 4% of opinion pieces published by Southern California's paper were from Latino authors. Again, we are nearly 50% of Los Angeles County and nearly 40% of the state of California, but we only authored 4% of the opinion pieces published in the Los Angeles Times newspaper. Opinion and editorial sections play an important role in our public discourse, providing a platform to present ideas and by putting pressure and spotlight on actions that are needed from our elected officials. It is well documented that opinion sections shape public opinion and public policy, making it especially shocking when a voice as significant as ours, the Latino community is left out. Invisibility and consequences. Invisibility has consequences. The disinformation and inaccurate portrayal of Latinos in this country has been tied to events such as mass shootings that occurred in El Paso, Texas and Gilroy, California, two heavily populated Latino communities. Without a platform for activists and leaders to evaluate important issues, we are missing the urgency needed to drive policy solutions for issues that range from closing the digital divide for our children, legalizing the status of dreamers, addressing the inadequate access to healthcare, pandemic economic recovery and environmental justice, all issues that should have the Latino lens. Now, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Sonia Diaz, founding director of the UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Initiative. Sonia? Thank you so much, Brenda. We are so excited at UCLA to be partnering with community and the National Hispanic Media Coalition plays an outsized role in the ways in which entertainment, media and technology can improve, can really meet the moment of the 21st century by ensuring that the nation's Latino communities, diverse in all of their myriad of ways, are actually having a seat at the table. And that is the, con the, the platform for why we did this research. And I'm gonna present some findings. I understand that Representative Joaquin Castro will be joining us. Once he comes in, I'm gonna tee it off to him. But as I present this finding, um, these research findings from UCLA Latino, the main thing that I want folks to realize here is, is that this was a persistent theme in our work around mobilization of Latino leaders. Whether it was working on Prop 187 or COVID-19 vaccine equity, there was a sense of high level community actors, philanthropists and others, that the Times was not reflecting in their op-ed pieces, their voices. And so a multi-generational team at UCLA sought to test this hypothesis. And what I'm prepared to show you is pretty appalling in terms of the representation of Latino voices in both the opinion and editorial sections of the Los Angeles Times. Um, this is just the table of contacts. I am going to focus today on findings. 
one of the things that's important about this as we talk about equity and inclusion is really population growth. There was only one demographic group that did not grow between 2010 and 2020, according to the 2020 US Census, and that's non-Hispanic whites. What field California's growth and the nation's growth were Asian Americans and Latinos. Now, one of the most important things is that our research on the Los Angeles Times sits with the literature that has been focused on the glaring underrepresentation and invisibility of Latinos. In fact, a GAO report found that Latinos were underrepresented across these subsectors. It was most pronounced in newspapers. One of the reasons that we focused on opinions and editorials and not necessarily articles is that there's a lot of empirical evidence that showcases how elected officials, policymakers, and others really look to these pieces as they start to formulate transformation, reforms, and proposals. And the omission of the nation's diverse Latino communities from these pages really leaves them out of the dialogue and outside of the table in important decisions that occupy whether or not they survive or thrive during a global pandemic. Our research methodology, one of the reasons that we focus on the Los Angeles Times is that it announces that it itself is the largest Metro Daily newspaper in the nation. It also defines itself and characterizes itself as a citizen of the city of Los Angeles, the state of California, the nation and the world. Here, Latinos are 48.6% of the Los Angeles County population. This is the largest jurisdiction in the United States. Latinos have been the plurality population of California since 2014. Now, in terms of our data and methods, we're really gonna focus on the op-eds. We thought about a descriptive interrogation, which is how many op-eds were authored by Latinos? So we did a random sample um, we've picked 120 days in 2020 and 60 days in 2021. This got us an N, a universe of 564 op-eds that were written by 425 authors. Um, many of the, the op-eds were from columnists and the fact that there are not adequate representation of Latino columnists at this paper is one of the reasons that the findings are what they are. Um, the other thing that's really important here is substance. It's not simply acceptable to have one Latino or a Latino. It's incumbent on all people who are presenting ideas to actually situate their ideas within the sphere of Latino issues and Latino communities, especially domestic policy. So we did a term search and I will um, identify at the end of this what some of those terms were and we were pretty favorable. Um, if uh, op-ed didn't focus on Latinos, that meant that none of the terms were there or they were only there one time. Moderately focused two to four times, centrally focused five or more times. So these are the major findings. Um, in terms of editorial board members at the Los Angeles Times, Latinos remain underrepresented. We captured this in um, the summer. And so you can look at the date. The board at that time was much larger than it currently is. We also looked at other papers, both papers with national audiences and those like the Miami Herald and Dallas Morning News that are in two states with large Latino populations. The second finding, this is descriptive representation. Only 4.3% of all op-eds were authored by a Latino author. Of all op-eds in our sample, only 1.4% were authored by a Latina. Remember, in California, Latinas are 20% of the demographic. They're the largest cohort of women in the state. Um, in terms of substance, only 4.8% of opinion editorials we're centrally focused on Latinos. And here's the other thing. When you publish Latino authors, you'll talk about Latinos by and large. So in terms of the editorial board, um, this is really important to think about because one of the paths forward is expanding the board to ensure that there is adequate and proportional, if at all, representation of Latinos. So in June, 2021, the Latino share of the editorial board was by far a 37.5 percentage point decrease in terms of the representation gap of the share of the county population. Um, whites had an overrepresentation. Again, when you think about the 2020 census, one group was decreasing, all other racial ethnic groups showed an increase. When we think about comparable newspapers, the Los Angeles Times lags behind. They lag behind the Washington Post, the New York Times, Miami Herald, and Dallas Morning News. 
Latino authors are grossly underrepresented in the in the LA Times. And so this is the big one here. And again, our report is at latino.ucla.edu. Only 4.3% of the op-eds that we studied during our sample were authored by at least one Latino author. What that means is nearly 96% of all of the op-eds were authored by non-Latinos. This is in a jurisdiction that is majority Latino. The representation, as I alluded to before, of Latinas was even more abysmal. And only 1.4% of op-eds during the sample were authored by Latinas. And obviously, when we look at gender, more male authors were able to publish an op-ed than female. But even when we think about the intersection of race and ethnicity and gender, Latinas are at the bottom of the totem pole. One of the things that's really important is that if you exclude or you render invisible certain voices, then those communities are also not going to be there. And so non-Latino authors are more likely to publish more than once. One of the things that the Los Angeles Times can do to remedy this is to hire more Latino contributors and to ensure that there's commission pieces so that Latinos have a voice in the paper of record. In terms of the centrality of focus, and this is important because it's not just Latinos who solely have to talk about Latinos. We can talk about the Arctic or we can talk about world affairs. Similarly, non-Latinos can talk about Latino communities and Latino issues, especially over the course of the study period that included a global pandemic, a national election, civil unrest, climate disasters. And so what this chart, this pie chart shows is that over 95% of the op-eds in this study did not mention Latinos at all, not a single time. And again, I, one needs to say the overrepresentation of Latino communities on the front lines of COVID-19, keeping the economy afloat, thinking about the Latinas that were exiting the workforce. If you think about infrastructure or you think about voting rights, these are issues that touch on and in fact integrate diverse Latino communities, yet they were absent. So um, one of the things that I wanna close with in the call to action, and I understand that we're going to have the representative here is that there are meaningful reforms and that these reforms have to be tied with two things, inclusion and equity. We frame this as Latino and non-Latino in terms of authorship because it is so pronounced the underrepresentation and the invisibility of Latinos. And so there is a need for the paper and this paper is not unique. Other papers suffer from similar diversity issues. We just focus on this one because community leaders time and time again, voice their frustrations. There needs to be an expansion of the editorial board. There also needs to be a meaningful increase in publishing opinion pieces that are authored by Latinos, especially Latinas. And there needs to be review processes, including commissioning, authors, channels, and pipelines so that Latino issues are not just um, on the shoulders of Latino authors, but really incumbent on anybody, again, who's touching on domestic issues. And finally, one of the things about this research is that it was very arduous. It took a year. And the reason that it took so long is, is that there was not any publicly available demographic data that existed on submissions, on staffing, et cetera. So if we think about how is the LA Times responding to the community's really strong and critical reflection that they are not made visible in this paper, in the opinion section or in the editorial, then we need to move forward and see where are we starting? And that's gonna start with data. I'm gonna stop. I know that that was a lot and I wanted to ensure that we have time for question and answer. And so on that note, you can on Zoom, type in any questions or answers and we will have a discussion, Brenda, Miguel and Representative Castro. As we await the representative, I'm gonna shift to my colleague, Miguel Santana, the president of the Weingart Foundation um, for his perspectives as a community leader. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, buenos dias, I'm Miguel Santana, president and CEO of the Weingart Foundation. The Weingart Foundation is a private foundation established 70 years ago in Los Angeles. Our mission is centered in advancing racial and social justice in Southern California. We support nonprofit organizations that address the historical inequities in our community and efforts to transform the failed systems that have disproportionately impacted historically marginalized communities. 
Central to this work is objective data and analysis by credible and independent experts. It is for this reason that we provide unrestricted operating support to the UCLA Latino Politics and Policy Initiative. Now, why is this report important? Latinos make up half of all Angelinos and the supermajority of all children. But when it comes to the major issues facing our region, the Latino community has experienced time and time again the losing end. Nothing showed this more, as Sonia stated, than the impact of the pandemic. Based on the number of cases, deaths, and the impacts uh, on the education and economic well being of our community. The Latino experience should not just be examined from the outside. To understand the solutions to these issues of inequality, Latino voices must be included. There are Latino experts in every field, from the economy to education, from homelessness to homeland security. Our region is re rich with thought leaders and academics, advocates and movement leaders, CEOs in the business and nonprofit sectors. Their point of view as leaders in these fields is also informed by their Latino experience. This perspective will not only add to the debate on policy questions, but in fact, creates the path forward to a more equitable Los Angeles. Now, I have personally subscribed to the Los Angeles Times my entire adult life. I still remember the pride we all felt when the landmark series On Latinos was published in the 1980s. It validated our experience, our dreams, our challenges and contributions. This series resulted from the advocacy and insistence of Latinos in the newsroom and in the community and was led by the legendary Frank Del Olmo, who was an important bridge between the LA Times and the Latino community. When Frank passed away, his role was not replaced. He left a huge gap, not only at the Times, but in Los Angeles. Yet, even with his absence, progress in representation has been made to include the Latino voice in the Times. More recently, the Times published and acknowledged the racial reckoning that the paper has had with the community. And we've seen the number of Latino increase in the newsroom as columnists and in the leadership of the paper. And for this, they should be acknowledged. But as this report demonstrates, more work can be done to ensure that the Latino perspective is included in all issues discussed by the opinion pages and that the voices of Latinos in their own words is included throughout the paper on every issue. I recently had the privilege of meeting the new editor of the LA Times a few months ago with Antonio Hernandez. We invited him to come to Southeast LA County to meet with a group of community leaders who were sh could, would share in their own words the experience that the community has undergone under COVID-19. We were very impressed that Kevin came to uh, the Southeast area and spent several hours talking to the community. I recently had an opportunity to talk to him about this report and he expressed a willingness to work with the community to do better. This is encouraging and we should, we should all work together to ensure that the Los Angeles Times reflects the community and its diversity. On behalf of the Weingart Foundation, I want to thank UCLA, the Lutzen School of Public Policy and LPPI for their work, not only on this issue, but in advancing the Latino perspective in politics and policy throughout California. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miguel. It's now my distinct honor to introduce Congressman Joaquin Castro, who has been a ferment advocate for representation, meaningful representation across the sector. Congressman. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And it's great to be with everybody. Thank you to Brenda and everybody at the National Hispanic Media Coalition. Thank you to the folks at UCLA for this report. Uh, I come to you as a Texan, of course, uh, from the great city of San Antonio, uh, but also an overwhelmingly Latino city that's about 64% Latino, much of it Mexican American, uh, in the same way that Los Angeles is a very diverse city, and much of it also Latino. And let me give you a little bit of context to the work that the CHC and I've been doing over the past two and a half or three years. Uh, 
We have worked over the past few years to make sure that in the United States, Latinos are culturally included across media platforms. Because the more I've looked into this and the more I've worked on it, the more I'm convinced that the Latino narrative has by and large been left out of the larger American narrative. And that there is a cost to that. And in some ways, there is also a danger to Latinos when that's the case. And so we started a few years ago meeting with uh, media executives in on different platforms uh, in entertainment. And so we planned a trip to Los Angeles in November of 2019 and met with about six or seven studios and Latino talent and the different guilds. We also met with uh, magazine publishers, Condé Nast, Hearst, uh, Meredith, for example. And then of course, with broadcasters, with Comcast NBC Universal, with Viacom CBS, and with print folks. So uh, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times last summer. And I want to speak of just for a second to the, the meeting with the Los Angeles Times. Well, first we had, I think all, most if not all of our Los Angeles members who were part of that meeting and who spoke uh, very animatedly about some of the critiques they had of the lack of Latino inclusion by the Los Angeles Times in covering the community and in giving voice to the community over the decades. And so uh, my, our meeting with the Los Angeles Times was interesting because I just mentioned that by now we've met with at least a few dozen outfits. And the Los Angeles Times, I have to say, was probably one of the most transparent groups that we met with, as opposed to where I would put the New York Times, for example. So the Los Angeles Times actually brought all of their top people from editorial to the newsroom, everybody to meet with us. And as Miguel mentioned, uh, I think that there has been some earnest attempt to get better and to try. Uh, and there's been an attempt to be more transparent. And so those are the baselines. That's what you want to see. But then in the end, you also want to see results. You want to see some change. And this is clearly one area where they continue to fail the Latino community. Uh, and as, a, as folks mentioned in our meeting with, with the LA Times last summer, that's what it represents. When you have a city that's almost 50% Latino and your newsroom is only about 13% Latino, when you have a city that's almost 50% Latino and you're only allowing uh, less than 5% of the op-eds to be written by Latinos and Latinas, it represents a failure for a large part of the community that you're supposed to be serving. So we were very candid with them and very direct last summer. And, and I would say that your research, this study, demonstrates that this is one more particular area where the Los Angeles Times is continuing to fail the Latino community and the people of Los Angeles. And I hope that they will work with the same earnestness uh, that they expressed in our meeting last year to actually take affirmative steps to change that. Uh, and so, of course, you know, we want to, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus wants to continue to be supportive of your work. Uh, I think of all the cities in the United States, we have the most representatives within our caucus that are from Los Angeles and care a great deal, obviously, about this issue. And I also hope that this can be a model for other cities and states in partnering with universities and other researchers to go figure out how well the San Antonio Express News has done uh, or the Boston Globe or the New York Times in this same way. And so thank you all very much for your research. And we want to be a partner with you in doing all of this work to make sure that Latinos and Latinas are included in the conversations across American society. As Miguel mentioned, it's not just, we can't just be confined to one issue, immigration. Uh, we have expertise in all the different areas of American society, whether it's healthcare, education, financial services, whatever it may be. And we have to be included when those things are spoken about and written about as well. So thank you thank so you much. Here. Thank you so much, Congressman, and thank you for your advocacy on behalf of all Americans, and particularly thinking about the media, news, and entertainment as a central feature of our democracy. It needs to reflect the America. Um, to that end, I want to encourage everybody, I know we have over 100 participants, which is wonderful, um, to engage in this dialogue. To the extent that you have any questions, please put them in the question and answer. Um, I'm going to tee this up for our panelists. I know, Representative Castro, you have to go, but you're welcome to stay as long as you want. I know you and Brenda are great friends. Brenda, this question is for you. 
Um, why does Latino representation matter, specifically in a place like Los Angeles? Los Angeles County is the largest jurisdiction in the United States of America. It also, um, in, in some ways, eclipsed our partners in Texas as a political center and really feeling national politics. When Latinos are not included in op-ed or editorial sections of a paper of the Southwest or the West, what does that mean for the nation's diverse Latino communities? But what does that mean for Latinos generally in the state of California? Well, first, if I can say, you know, this is, re this is the reason why NHMC focuses on all forms of media, because it is one of the most influential and powerful institutions that shape attitudes, values, and beliefs of society. And Los Angeles County, I mean, we're 50% of the population. And why is it so important? Well, when we're invisible, that means that we're not important. Our views are not important. Our voices are not heard, whether it's the LA Times or other forms of media. And think about what that does to our children. I was a teacher at one point in my life, and I have to tell you, Children would mispronounce their last names. Even if they were Spanish, they would anglicize them because they were the sh a shame of their heritage. And I wonder about those children who are now adults and how they feel about their community and what are they teaching their children? Not having a voice, being ignored affects all of us in society. And I truly believe it's connected to the hate that goes on in this country against Latinos. And that's why we had the massacre in El Paso because there were so many ads placed and talked about the Hispanic invasion, yet Texas was a part of Mexico. And they kept on talking about the border invasion and that domestic terrorists who drove over 600 miles across Texas he massacred 23 people and injured another 23. And in his manifesto, he said he was taking out the Hispanic invasion. I mean, think about that. Words are powerful. They're real, true life consequences. And sometimes it's a matter of life or death. In Gilroy, again, the same thing, you know, this domestic terrorist went to take out what he considered mestizos. That's what he wrote in his Instagram account. I mean, that's us, right? We're a mixture. Thanks for that. And, you know, we, we know that Vincente Fernandez just passed away. And in, in that celebration of honor, there was another act of violence here at home. Um, Congressman Castro, I think one of the things that's important, and you're a policymaker, why do opinions matter? And who reads them? What do they lead to? And when some communities are not included, what does that mean about transformation, reform, or policy ideation? Sure, uh, let me take different pieces of those. Um, well, it's important because it's a matter of, of who gets to speak about issues across the board whether it's immigration or healthcare or education, and who is perceived as having the knowledge and the expertise that moves a policy debate forward, for example, or informs where as Americans we should be on policy uh, or the different perspectives on policy, uh, including one's impact on members of a state legislature or city council or the US Congress. Uh, I, would, I would suspect that, and I just got to see the top lines of the study because I flew in from Washington back home to San Antonio this morning, but I, I would assume you have the same challenge with the New York Times and the Washington Post, for example, that you have with the Los Angeles Times. And as you all know, those, even though our media is much more diverse in terms of where people get their news now, uh, now there are a lot of folks that are getting their news off of the internet, off of Facebook, for example, but uh, these, these publications still have incredible influence on the policy debates in our nation especially in our nation's capital and at state capitals across the country. And so if Latino and Latina voices are left out of that, then we're not hearing from them, we're not hearing their perspective. But then uh, finally on this, there's also a larger challenge there and a larger cost to not being included. Uh, and that is that you basically are being made irrelevant. 
you're being sidelined in a country where you're literally almost 20% of the country. And just to take this case in point in Los Angeles, uh, a city where you're almost half of the city, you're almost half of the city, but you're only, you're less than 5% of the voices on the main newspaper's editorial page. And you think about what that means to be silenced and really for the Los Angeles Times in this instance, to sideline a whole group of people and basically say your opinions, your perspectives, what you think, what you care about doesn't matter because we're only gonna give you this much space and, and this often to actually write in our newspaper. That is a very deep and serious kind of cultural exclusion. It represents a kind of cultural exclusion that is rampant still across American media and really in, across our newspapers as well. It really is a form of discrimination, period. That's it. Um, you know, I wanted to add, my father was an avid reader of the Al LA Times, and he used to take it very serious when he came, to what they said in the newspaper when he came to measures and, you know, who he's going to vote for. He actually sat down, read everything, and it really did affect his opinion and his vote. So that's why it's so important. Some, some people are too busy, they don't understand different measures and they really take it serious. And that's why, you know, our voice should be included. It should, you know, our authors should be included in the LA Times. And to that note, you know, these papers, especially the editorial board, they make consequential opinions on candidate endorsements, on measures. Los Angeles has seen great transformation, really fueled by the community, whether this is on justice reform or housing expansion, dealing with housing insecurity. I know that a lot of elected officials um, really fear retribution by speaking out about this exclusion because you know it's a double-edged sword. You want to acknowledge the need for representation, but at the same time, there is a paper that simply um, does not provide that space, but still holds an outsized role in what we can call an aging white electorate. And so to that end, I wanna lift up the work of the Latino caucus of California counties. Counties are huge. And we understand that they sent a letter to the paper's owner. And this was authored by supervisor Manuel Perez, who is a Riverside County supervisor and supervisor Luis Salejo, who has served not only in the legislature, but is now on the Monterey, Monterey County Board of Supervisors. And they identified the path forward and some of the things that need to happen. I wanna bring Miguel into this conversation because Miguel, you as someone who has been a leader in the area and also had some face time, there is a lot of turnover. We see that there are changes in terms of the times, both in terms of ownership, but also editors. Now, what does it mean to really meaningfully address um, the exclusion of Latino voices now in the 21st century as we're looking towards recovery? So La Los Angeles is the Latino city. Um, and not only as we've stated, do we represent half of the, of the population, but on the issues that are most critical in this region, we are the face of those issues in our children in the housing crisis, among those who are don't have access to health care, among those who are struggling to survive. And the editorial page is really a group of people who are problem solvers. They spend time uh, thinking about these questions, analyzing the facts talking to experts, uh, reaching out to a broad array of community to try to present the best solution forward. And as you stated, we've seen time and time again how effective that is. And I've been fortunate that I've been asked on many, many occasions to provide my own thoughts about issues, and I feel it's my responsibility to do so. The community isn't going anywhere, and neither is the LA Times. Our futures are intertwined. And so like any relationship, you have to work on it with intention. And so we've heard from the editor of the other times who's very committed to diversity and inclusion in, throughout the paper. And he's making the efforts to make those changes. I, he welcomes the opportunity to meet with the leadership of the community to find ways in which to engage and to do better, to include voices of our community and everything that they do. And so I think we should take them up on that offer. It also means that as a community, 
we need to walk into the room with a voice. We need to be prepared to provide our thoughts, our opinions, our solutions, our, our best thinking on the big issues of the day. And a lot and arm our, with our, come armed with the experts in our community who understand those issues across the board from the economy to homelessness. And so we have work to do as well. But I think as you've demonstrated through the partnership at the state and in other parts of policy work and advocacy, when efforts are combined, we could see tremendous progress being made. And ultimately, a Los Angeles that doesn't include solutions from the Latino community is not a Los Angeles that is surviving and thriving. So it requires our voice in all of the issues we're confronting. And Miguel, I think that's really important because um, this research was in response to community leaders. Miguel, you and I were part of a table that really sought to commemorate the 25 years after the xenophobic passage of Proposition 187. And that included a multidimensional group of work, whether it was a documentary that figured prominently on KCT or an in-person event an educational curriculum that predated this attack on critical race theory. And yet the Times did not give voice or lend voice to leaders of that struggle when, when trying to place an op-ed. And we were confronted with a pandemic that really squarely situated Los Angeles as the epicenter North America for COVID-19. The New York Times Magazine featured horrible photos of Latino workers on their deathbed. And what we understand from Latino electeds, and I'll say this as researchers, is time and time again, people try to give voice to these issues. And they either did not get responses from the op-ed when they submitted, I see this in the chat, or they just frankly are going to other papers, whether this is Cal Matters or the Sacramento Bee or even Politico. And so Brenda, one of the things here is, and I'm seeing this in the chat and in the questions, it's, it's, it's not an issue of pipeline, right? Of training more reporters, but it's just the fact that we are not included. And it's not sufficient to talk about the work to address through truth and reconciliation or other means, the racist past of this paper and to embrace diversity, that there needs to be a different approach to this. And this is why the research is framed as Latino and non-Latino authors. What does Latino exclusion mean, given the fact that this is the second largest demographic group in the country and the one that is fueling the current and future workforce? You know, in 2021, I myself submitted a op-ed to the Los Angeles Times. And, you know, we, we NHMC works a lot in policy in Washington, D.C. And one of the things that we work on that I'm so concerned about is closing the digital divide for our children. And, you know, everyone saw the uh, photo went viral with the two young Latinas sitting, I believe, on asphalt at a fast food uh, restaurant, just trying to get the Wi-Fi to do their homework during this pandemic. So I, I wrote an op-ed section, I mean, op-ed on the EB, the emergency broadband benefit. And I didn't hear back from the Times and I think it ended up, the San Antonio um, Express newspaper picked it up. Now it is a national topic, so I'm glad somebody picked it up, but you know, we're headquartered here in California. I would have thought that the Los Angeles, Los Angeles Times would have picked it up. It's a, it's a very topical issue. It's an issue not only for Latino children, um, but all children in the United States. And I'm just so concerned because I don't feel our children have received an education, a good education during this time, during the pandemic. And it's kind of like a domino effect. If they don't receive a good education, what's gonna happen when they apply to, when they, do they graduate from high school? What do, when they apply to college, are they gonna get in? Are they gonna do, you know, good in the SAT, then if they don't go to college, what kind of minimal jobs are they gonna have? They're gonna have jobs without health insurance. Are they ever gonna be able to buy their own home? It really is a domino effect. So our voices need to be heard. They need to be on the op-ed section because this really not only affects us in the present day, but in the future. And, you know, we have so many experts and so many fields and it's not, the problem is not having Latinos submit op-eds. 
is that we're not granted that opportunity. Thank you for that, Brenda. And I want to um, invite council member Kevin DeLeon just for brief comments. He was part of the SOMOS group and one of the people that flagged um, the exclusion of these voices that is now supported by empirical evidence. Council member? Well, well thank you so much, Sonia. And uh, this is uh, amazing work. I think a lot of folks knew that uh, it, it was pretty bad. We didn't know it was this bad. And now backed up with real empirical evidence uh, by your research team at, at UCLA. Um, a lot of folks said some really great things. I would just say, there's not much I can add. Like Joaquin, I just read the top lines uh, that uh, uh, was provided to all of us, but it's about culture and about it starts at the very top. And whether it's the owner of the newspaper or whether it's the publisher, it's the gatekeeper to uh, editorials. I know there's some very fine writers that we all know uh, who are part of the editorial board, uh, but like Brenda had mentioned, there's not lack of supply of content or authorship on important issues, not just exclusive to the issue of immigration or with their known Western hemisphere, but an issue of climate change, public health, public safety, the economy, financial products. It's about actually, it's about exclusion or are we going to include and be a real reflection of the amazing diversity that is the great city of Los Angeles, 50% Latino population and to be historically ignored, but only for the intelligentsia classes uh, is not healthy. Uh, for a city like LA, it's not healthy for its state. It's not healthy for our country. So I just wanna commend all the great folks who have been speaking and to you and your incredible team. And it's about culture. And if this institution is gonna profoundly change the culture to be inclusive of all voices, regardless of who you are and where you come from. Thank you so much, council members. So as we draw to a close, I'm gonna bring uh, Miguel back in and then Brenda. Miguel, question for you. Um, you know, one of the things is, is the idea of readership, right? And so who is reading now and does that in any way necessitate who needs to be included? Um, that's kind of a false choice because the future and the sustainability of any business is really one that is going to integrate diverse communities of color who are the growth economy, who are the current and future workforces. So can you speak about how including Latinos and including underrepresented minorities generally actually makes business sense? Well, I think it's it's a survival strategy. Uh, any, any institution in Southern California, in California, and frankly, and throughout the country that isn't reflecting the growing markets and in this case, the most dominant market is on a trajectory of dying. And um, so it is, it is an important strategy for survival to be able to reflect the market that you're in and to incorporate their view of the world in the day-to-day -day work of, of, of your activities. And so you see that in the arts, you see that in higher education, you see it in every business that is trying to survive, trying to figure out how do we talk to a community. And the best way of doing that, frankly, is by incorporating the community throughout your organization so that every decision that is being made, every choice about what you talk about versus what you don't talk about and how you talk about it is embedded in the perspective of, of that community. And so this is an important question, not just because it makes business sense, but very frankly, it has a bigger implication as it relates to our democracy. We, we need a thriving Los Angeles Times to protect our democracy for this country, to ensure accountability on the issues that are important among our government and to hold all of us accountable to, to the truth and to um, data and analysis. And it's for that reason that we care. As Latinos, we care because we value the role that, that the LA Times plays in the survival of our democracy and making our community better. So it doesn't just make business sense. It is the right thing to do to ensure that we have a thriving civic society and the role of journalism, of independent thinking, of problem solving is an essential part of a healthy democracy. And we as a community are insisting to be part of it. 
Thank you, Miguel. Um, and I'm going to pivot to Brenda. Brenda, LPPI received an email from Hillary Manning from the Los Angeles Times in response to our report. And it included a statement. And in the statement, it talked about a commitment of improving diversity, equity, and inclusion at the Times, despite quote unquote economic challenges of sustaining a journalistic enterprise during an ongoing pandemic. To Miguel's point, there's the opportunity to scale a business, to grow the business. And in that way, inclusion has a role. Um, Tom Signs of Maldive talks about diversity. Diversity does not really get to root causes of gross underrepresentation or disparate impact if it is similar and it really functions as equality. In a place that is majority Latino, a state that is plurality Latino, diversity is not going to remedy the perverse underrepresentation of Latino voices in the op-ed and editorial sections. So to that point, Hillary Manny um, identified to Latinas in her statement in response to this research. Jean Guerrero, a Los Angeles Times opinion columnist who was hired in July, 2021. And then also Mariel Garza, who joined the editorial board um, in 2015 and is now on the masthead. She is the first Latina in the history of the Los Angeles Times to be on a masthead. I understand that there's only been four in that history. Can you talk about how, although these are great that a community as heterogeneous and as numerous as Latinos still do not understand that this monolithic or you know singular kind of corrections that they're insufficient. Can you can you like just talk about this because I think that we suffer from this idea of diversity when we're really not penetrating the gross underrepresentation or the disparate impact. What does this mean in terms of inclusion and representation for Latinos? and how one person really can't carry that on their shoulders, but it's incumbent on all of us. You know, I, um, I applaud the, I'm thankful that th there has been some changes and there has been some promotions. I myself love reading Daniel Hernandez's stories. I used to work at the Times while I was putting myself through college. And I was an editorial, just a messenger gopher back in 19, the 1980s. The same, that's 30 some years ago, the same issues they had then when it was owned by the Chandlers, I believe, is the same issues they have today in 2021. And now it's owned by Dr. Patrick Sung Chung. The same issues. This is a structure that needs to be broken down and built back up. So I'm glad you're getting a response, but these statistics are shocking. I would expect the Dr. Sun Shong, the executive chairman would reach out to you today, Sonia. I expect at minimum, Kevin Merida to reach out to you today. They have a structure that they need to break down to build back up because it, all these issues have been there since I worked there as a, as a college student 30 some years ago. A deep breath, right? Um, as, as someone who was born and raised in Los Angeles and also one who focuses clearly on population and demographic change, the persistence of this underrepresentation in the face of widespread dynamic growth of this community only serves to widen the disparity and make the invisible even more obsolete. So I wanna thank you, Brenda, and I wanna thank you, Miguel, and obviously Representative Castro for engaging in this conversation, this community briefing about empirical data as to why representation matters in our press. You can find more about UCLA's Latino Policy and Politics Initiative at www.latino.ucla.edu. Um, we are very active on Twitter at UCLA Latino. And I do wanna close by giving a tremendous shout out to the LPPI team. This research was issue spotted by community leaders and it was undertaken by our director of research, Dr. Rodrigo Dominguez Vegas, myself, and a team of awesome multi-generational research fellows, including Taman An, um, Brianna and Adriana, 
And I just am so grateful because this was a really big learning experience. It was not easy to collect this data. And I hope that we will continue to stand with community to ensure that every issue is a Latino issue. So with that, happiest of holidays, and thank you so much for engaging with us. Take good care.